machine learning and data analysis. So thanks, Michael. And uh, a lot of the work I'm going to be talking about is actually joined with Michael, so you can get me what Michael has been doing also over the past several years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk about uh, one particular side um, uh, of um, randomized numerical linear algebra. And um, this side is going to be the notion of leverage scores, how you can use leverage scores uh, to basically figure out within a matrix which columns, which rows of the matrix are influential. As we're going to see, you can generalize this to actually even look at elements. That's going to come towards the end uh, of the talk. Uh, let me just give the brief introduction, what the leverage scores are. Think of them as a statistic over the rows or the counts of the matrix that's going to reveal influence in a way that we're going to make precise a little bit later uh, during the talk. How did this start? Uh, it actually started um, in theoretical computer science. And the idea was the following. You are given a matrix, A, M by N. You want to sketch the matrix. So you want to basically take A and keep only a few of its rows and form this matrix R, which is an R by N matrix with R now much smaller than M. How do you create this sketch? Well, here's a very, very simple approach. Create a probability distribution, construct a probability distribution over the rows of A, P1 up to P sub M. And in IID trials, if you don't know what that is, that's independent identically distributed trials, you're going to sample rows of the matrix with respect to those probabilities. And sample R of those rows and return uh, the matrix, the R by N matrix that uh, contains the rows that you sampled. Very simple approach. You sketch your matrix by just keeping a subset of the rows. For reasons that will become a little bit clearer later, uh, you might want to rescale when you sample. And you rescale to make the various estimators you are going to run later on unbiased. And the question, of course, is what is a good sampling probability? And let me say that these kind of sketches uh, have become, became very popular in uh, theoretical computer science when things like the streaming model were introduced where basically you have massive matrices and uh, they stream in front of you and you very quickly want to make a decision, am I going to keep this row or discard it? Okay. So I'm not defining an objective right now. Downstream, it could be anything. You want to approximate singular values, singular vectors, cluster the rows, cluster the columns, apply support vector machines, whatever you want. The question is, let's get some sort of a sketch of the matrix that in downstream applications is going to be useful. And I'll show a couple of downstream applications, and like a dozen of those have been explored uh, in other work. So the question becomes, what is a good sampling probability? Again, you want to keep information in the matrix. This is the first probability distribution that goes back 15 years now. And the idea is you are going to keep rows of the matrix with probability proportional to their Euclidean norm squared. If you don't remember what the Euclidean norm square of a matrix is, it's of uh, a vector is, it's basically just the sum of the squares of the entries in the vector. Think of a 0, 1 matrix. That's typically the simplest example that I like to give. If you have a 0, 1 matrix, this probability distribution is going to bias you towards denser rows, basically rows that contain more non-zero entries. And that's probably a good idea. If I told you that you know, here is a matrix that is sparse, you might want to keep some of the denser rows because they would reveal perhaps a little bit more information about the matrix. Turns out you can prove a bunch of things. And again, this goes back quite a bit. Uh, but you can, for example, get some approximations to things like the singular value decomposition of a matrix. If you don't know what that is, that's basically an approximation to singular values and singular vectors of the matrix. You can get other factorizations, CUR, CX. We'll talk about this a bit later. Nystrom method, which is um, related to machine learning tasks, clustering and classification, and so on and so forth. The key term here is that this is going to give you what, in theoretical computer science, you would call additive error approximations. Think of them as a fairly large scale error. So you get some coarse idea about your matrix, but it's not going to be sufficiently fine to be able to do real data analysis, really refined data analysis. But again, in certain cases, this might be the only thing you can do. Just get a ballpark figure of what your matrix does. A much better idea is to sample, but this came, of course, a little bit later, is to sample with a more refined probability distribution. What is the probability distribution? You are still going to sample rows from A. So you are still going to sample rows from the original matrix A. But the sampling probabilities now, you're going to compute them 
from the left singular vectors of A. So, U sub K is the matrix of the top K left singular vectors of A. The columns of U sub K are pairwise orthogonal and normal. That's what singular vectors do. The rows of U sub K, you don't know much about. The only thing you know is that they're Euclidean norms. If you sum the squares of the entries across a row, it's going to be between 0 and 1. That's pretty much the only thing you're going to know. The columns, pairwise orthogonal and normal. The rows, you don't know much. If you use those Euclidean norms of the rows of U to form the probability distribution, and sample, for example, with respect to those probabilities, it turns out that you can get much more accurate results. So let me repeat this. What am I doing? I'm still sampling from A, of course. But in order to form the probability distribution, I'm going to look at the top K left singular vectors of A. And I'm going to form the probability distribution by taking the Euclidean norms of the rows of those top K left singular vectors of A. So I complicated the problem. First of all, what is a good choice for K? We're going to see that in a number of applications, this is going to be a natural parameter. So it's going to be basically defined by the problem. Second, I need access to the left singular vectors of A. That's not a trivial task. Turns out that approximation suffice. Turns out that there is a lot of work in the past few years which can allow us to compute those approximations fast and efficiently. So that's the leverage scores. This is the leverage score sampling. When we came up with this idea half a dozen years ago or so with Michael, we gave it a different name. But then you go around, you talk to people enough, and you realize that other people have thought about these particular scores. Turns out they've been used in statistics for outlier detection. As we're going to see, that's because they disproportionately influence when the leverage score is high. It disproportionately influences things like regression, principal components analysis, and so on and so forth. Instead of additive error approximations, if you can sample with respect to leverage scores, you're going to get the relative error approximations for a bunch of problems, such as the singular value decomposition, CUR and CX, we'll see that, regression problems, especially over and under constraint regression problems, solving systems of linear equations with Laplacian input matrices, that's a famous line of work uh, in theoretical computer science, and I'll very briefly discuss it a bit later. I'm be, I've been talking about row sampling because the column sampling is the same. Instead of looking at the matrix at A, look at A transpose and sample rows from A transpose. So that would be column sampling. So row and column sampling basically are interchangeable. Let me talk about settings where the leverage scores arise. Here is a tall and thin matrix A, N by D. Think of this as being the design matrix in um, a regression problem. So this basically could correspond to constraints, the rows of A, and the columns could correspond to variables. So you would want to do something like AX minus B minimize over all X. Well, a natural question to ask would be, is it possible to get a, a subset of rows from A and work with just that subset? So work with a subset of the constraints as opposed to working with all the constraints? Leverage scores come up there. Mm -hmm. This is the singular value of the composition. If you've never seen that, what it does, it basically expresses A as a product of left singular vectors times a diagonal matrix, the singular values times the right singular vectors. The only matrix I'm going to need here is the left singular vectors. I'm going to compute my leverage scores by looking at the whole matrix U. Because it's tall and thin, I'm going to focus on the whole matrix. This parameter K that I had before is going to be equal to D. So I'm going to look at just the whole spectrum. Assume it's full rank. If it's not full rank, we can deal with all these things, but I don't want to uh, burden you with too many technicalities. And now for the tall and thin case, my leverage scores are going to be the Euclidean norms of the rows of U. You could sample with respect to the leverage scores, and then you would be able uh, to get a subset of rows from the matrix. You could solve, for example, your regression problem using just this subset of rows. And you would get relative error approximations to the actual regression problem. Short and fat, that is sort of the symmetric case, same story. This time, you have a matrix that is D by N. N is much larger than D. This is the singular value decomposition, U sigma V transpose. And this time, I'm going to sample with scores that depend on the rows of V, which are columns of V transpose. And this would be my leverage scores here. Again, same story, K is equal to D. 
This time, if you want to think of it as a regression problem, your design matrix has D constraints and variables. So this is basically the under constraint case. This time, you would basically select a few counts from A to create the sketch from A. What's, uh, what's an application for this case? Uh, regression. Think again. This is under constraint regression. You have D constraints. Put a vector x here. So that would be the vector of variables. You have a lot more variables. You're going to select a small number of variables, solve your regression problem using only um, the selected variables. I'm selecting columns. So it's, it's Absolutely, yes. The it's the same as the previous one. It just transposed the thing, yes. The general case. M by N matrix this time. M comparable to N, so you're not going to be able to say M much larger than N or vice versa. In this case, you can define rho and column leverage scores basically by focusing on a low rank approximation to the matrix. So you start with A. Look at a low rank approximation to A. In this case, I'm looking at, the, at what is called the best low rank approximation to A in the sense that A minus A sub K is the best possible among all rank K matrices. These are the top K left singular vectors, top K singular values, top K right singular vectors. And you can define row and column leverage scores by looking at the Euclidean norms of the rows of U, the Euclidean norms of the columns of VK. So you have leverage scores for the rows, leverage scores for the columns. You can use one or the other or both to select columns and or rows from your matrix with respect to those leverage scores. Where have they been applied? Tall and thin, short and fat, over or under constrained regression problems. So that was the original application. Goes back now half a dozen years. Since then, lots of extensions. Of course, we, we originally looked at just L2 regression, which is least squares regression. Um, eventually, we did LP regression for all P between 1 and infinity. A lot of this work is highly technical. Michael has done uh, quantile regression uh, more recently. Feature selection in the CX factorization, that's what I'm going to talk about actually mostly today because I want to show an application to population genetics. This is a line of research that was pioneered by Dan Spielman and Sen Hua Teng. It has to do with the following. You are given a system of linear equations where the input matrix is a Laplacian matrix, so it corresponds to a graph. You want to solve this system without dependency on the condition number. So if you are a numerical analyst, this should already raise some flags. This is very difficult to do unless you apply exact methods like Gaussian elimination, which, of course, takes a long time to terminate. Um, you want to solve it without dependency on the condition number up to relative error. Surprisingly, for Laplacian matrices, you can do that in time that is proportional to the number of non-zero entries in the matrix. So a celebrated line of results there. It turns out that the current state of the art results start by creating what is called the preconditioner of the matrix by subsampling a small number of basically rows and columns from the matrix with respect to what is called the effective resistance. And these are the leverage scores. So it turns out they're equivalent to leverage scores. So within this particular context, I'm going to get back to this, I think, a little bit later, but I'm not going to say too much about that. Finally, recently, literally within the past six months or so, a number of papers have started appearing defining element-wise leverage scores. So, so far, I defined leverage scores for rows and columns. Can you do something similar for elements? Turns out that the answer is yes, and there is some elegant theory there as well. I'm going to focus on mostly the feature selection, which connects to the CX factorization, and if I get time, element-wise sampling. So yeah. So, so the idea for element-wise would be for every element, tell me the influence. <coughs> Think of uh, you know SNP data. I'd like to see a particular combination of sample and SNP that is particularly influential for the matrix. So that's, uh, whereas now I can tell you something about the whole sample or the whole SNP. So I'd like to have finer control. And not surprisingly, that's a little bit harder. Let me start by saying two things. First of all, why do they work? That's going to be a little bit technical. I want to connect this. Uh, to, again, a very nice line of work that goes back to Burgen. Um, the second thing that I want to discuss is how fast can we compute them? I already said that basically to compute leverage scores, you need access to singular vectors. Well, approximations suffice. Turns out we can formalize that, and indeed, approximations suffice. 
Uh, so it's not as bad as computing singular vectors, basically. So why do they work? So bear with me for a couple of minutes. Um, any proof that I know that at some point uses leverage scores, it's going to use an argument of the following form. You're going to have some orthogonal matrix that looks like this, tall and thin, n by d, n rows, d columns, n much larger than d. And it's going to subsample this matrix and create a smaller matrix, a subset of rows from this matrix. Here's the smaller matrix, call it u tilde. And this is orthogonal, so this means that all the columns here are pairwise orthogonal and normal. What is u tilde? So you need to characterize the sampled version of u. And you're going to sample with probabilities that depend on the Euclidean norms of u. And I have exact probabilities here, approximations again suffice, but we're not going to get into that. The point is that this matrix is precisely orthogonal. What about this matrix? This has R rows, D columns. Is it orthogonal? And one property of orthogonal matrices is that all their singular values are equal to 1. So one way to characterize U tilde is to ask how close are the singular values of U tilde to 1. Turns out that you can precisely answer this question. You can say that basically all the singular values of U tilde are going to be 1 plus minus epsilon as long as you sample a sufficient number of rows from, a, from U. Sufficient number in this case is of this form. D over epsilon square, where epsilon is how far away you're going to be from 1. Log D over epsilon square, and there is a failure probability, of course, because you are doing sampling. And there is a lot of work trying to bring this down. This goes back. This question is fundamental. Sampling or selecting, in general, you don't have to sample, rows from U to create a matrix U tilde that is approximately orthogonal uh, has been fundamental in trying to prove things like the Cassin's free reconjecture in operator theory. And that was proven, actually, last year by uh, Dan Spielman, Nikhil Srivastava, and Adam Marcus using techniques that are a couple of generations after the techniques that we are using here. And the idea is that you are able to control all these terms much, much more precisely. But these days, at least this very simple problem, how close is U tilde to being orthogonal, can be addressed but wha by what is called, I have it here, matrix Chernoff and matrix Bernstein bounds. How many people have seen matrix Bernstein bounds, matrix Chernoff bounds? Okay, about a couple. How many people have seen Chernoff bounds? Okay. Think of Chernoff, what are Chernoff bounds doing? You have a sum of random variables. And of course, you know that if those random variables are bounded and they have uh, well-behaved first and second moments, then you sum them up. And if there are enough of them, central limit theorem is telling us that you are going to get a normal distribution. What if you have fewer? You have n, but n is not necessarily equal to infinity. It doesn't tend to infinity. Well, matrix Chern uh, sorry, Chernoff and Bernstein bounds tell us how close we're going to get to the expectation um, for finite n. What if you have random variables that are not numbers, but are matrices? That's what matrix Bernstein and matrix Chernoff tell us. How does a sum of random variables that are now matrices behave? Very nice methodology. If you've ever seen the proof of a Chernoff bound, you know that this is something you can teach in a graduate class on probability theory. Matrix Chernoff is a little bit more complicated, but not too much more. It's a very analogous proof, still uses the method of moments. And it gives us this proof in about half a page. So using a matrix Bernstein bound, if you are willing to treat it as a black box, and these days there are a couple of reviews, so you can just take your favorite matrix Bernstein or matrix Chernoff bound from there. You can apply to this problem, and you can get this particular result bound in the singular values of this random sampled matrix. Let me say that um, if you care about this more, uh, there was this whole big data program last um, year, last, last semester, last year, at uh, the Simons Foundation. Uh, Michael, myself, Joel Tropp, uh, we're giving tutorials over there, which I believe are online now. And uh, a lot of this machinery has been explained at a certain level of detail there. The advantage of actually being able to say that this matrix U tilde is approximately orthogonal, the advantage that you actually get is that you can manipulate it uh, 
fairly easily in downstream applications. So the pseudo inverses well behaved, the utilities well behaved, the condition number is bounded, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to get into those details, but I wanted to at least show the heart of the proof, which basically says that if you randomly, carefully subsample this matrix U, you can get an approximately orthogonal matrix U tilde. <coughs> Computing leverage scores. A simple way to compute them is, of course, to compute the left singular vectors and the right singular vectors themselves. If you have n by d matrices with n larger than d, that's n d squared time, fine. Or for m by n matrices, it's m squared n, m n squared time. So you can do that. The question is, can we do something more efficient? Well, you can get relative error approximations to all the leverage scores in the following sense. Um, if this is your matrix A, it turns out that you can approximate the left singular vectors of A as follows. The QR decomposition is one way to compute a subspace that spans the column space of A. It's basically gram smith orthomogranization, but in a numerically stable way. That's what QR factorization is. Then you can get Q, which is equivalent, it spans the same space as the left singular vectors of A by just getting forget about the p here, by just getting a times r to the minus 1. The idea we had is that we can get an approximation to the inverse of r in a much more efficient way by doing random projections. I'm not going to get into the details of that. What we are getting when all is said and done is that we can get approximations, relative approximations to the, relative to the leverage scores in time that is order n d over epsilon as opposed to order n d square. So we save a factor of d. Remember, you're going to need to read the matrix A, so you're not going to be at order ND. And this is close. And since then, I believe there have been even uh, small improvements here uh, that get slightly better run times. This is for N by D matrices, where N is much larger than D. What about M by N matrices, where now you have a target uh, rank parameter K? It turns out that in this case, you need to be careful in formulating the problem. This has to do with the fact that if two singular values are identical, then they can swap in and out of the top k subspace uh, easily. And that changes the definition of the leverage scores. So you're going to need to formulate this problem in a way that makes sense from a statistical perspective. We have done that. I'm not going to uh, say too much about this, except to basically say that even in this setting, we can get an approximation to the leverage scores that is meaningful. Uh, in time that is order m and k over epsilon. Um, remember, the dimensions of a matrix are m by n. Um, the extra factor of k, again, if you are a numerical analyst, this is the kind of factor that you expect to appear uh, if you run, for example, something like uh, iterative techniques, like uh, Krylov uh, methods or Lanxos approximations to get approximations to the singular uh, vectors of the matrix. This would be the additional term that would appear there. It appears also in our work. And I believe. I should have the citations here. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Michael and uh, my colleague uh, Malik Magdan, is my LAT RPI, and uh, uh, David Woodruff at IBM. OK. So, how yeah. does the effect of one over epsilon? In what sense? I mean, theoretically or experimentally? Experimentally. OK. Um, so, experimentally, things are better than you expect. But this is, in the, in the worst case, in theory, this term is there. We're not going to be able to break this term. This term will be there. So there are lower bounds, uh, low bound constructions where this term is going to be there. Experimentally, of course, the matrices are not are not behaving so badly. Um, I should mention that uh, Michael and uh, Alex Gittens have a paper where they have actually experimentally evaluated this on hundreds of matrices, I believe, um, and they have shown uh, that the algorithm works reasonably well empirically. So this is the approach that I would use for sufficiently large matrices. OK, let me briefly talk about an application. Uh, this application is on uh, human genetics and uh, SNP data. Uh, human genome, we're all highly similar. Often quoted numbers are 90%, 99% that our genomes are highly identical. But of course, there are well-known loci where we are polymorphic. One such type is the so-called single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. They are loci in the genome where out of the four possible alleles, A, C, T, and G, exactly two appear. Uh, so if you look at any of these counts, you're going to see here it's only A and G, here it's only C and T, and so on and so forth. Uh, very well structured. There are lots of those loci. 10 million is an often quoted number. 
Um, the nice thing is that today you can get data on thousands of individuals for millions of those markers, for millions of SNPs. From a computer science perspective, think of this as a matrix where every entry in the matrix takes one of three possible values, plus one, minus one, zero. Don't worry too much about the population genetics. For those of you who are experts or who know more, I guess, on average, um, basically an individual can be homozygotic in one allele, homozygotic in the other allele, or heterozygotic. This is where the three possible values come out from. And you can encode this whole thing as a matrix of three possible values or three colors. I'm going to color one such matrix in a little bit. Um, I always show this example because these data are easy to get. They are publicly available. Um, they combine uh, two well-known projects. The first one is the Human Genome Diversity Panel. Uh, about 1,000 samples, seven geographic regions, about 50 populations. And as you can see, they have reasonable coverage from many areas in the world. There are much nicer collections these days, not all of them publicly available. Let's combine it with yet another data set, the, the HAPNOP Phase 3 data, 1,200 samples, 11 populations. Uh, keep an eye out for the Mexican population here. Um, it's going to pop up in a minute. Uh, you do some filtering of the data. You join the two data sets. You end up with about 2,200 subjects. Those are the rows of your matrix. About 450,000 features, the SNPs, the single nucleotide polymorphisms, those are the columns of your matrix. About a billion entries. It might sound like a very large matrix. It's not. It's actually a matrix that I can easily handle in my laptop. Uh, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to apply principal components analysis. That's the first thing you do whenever I get a matrix. I sort of want to see the matrix. One easy way to do that is to apply uh, PCA to look at the first two, three, four, and so on principal components, see what's going on. Just to make sure that we're all on the same page, when you're applying principal component analysis on a matrix, you are basically looking. You have 450,000 features, so an enormous space, very high dimensional space. I'm going to look here at just the top two ideal axes of variance, basically. So the two axes that capture most of the variance in my data. So I take 450,000 dimensions, and in a principled way, I project it down to just two dimensions. This is the first dimension, the first axis, the first eigen SNP. That's the term that uh, uh, David Altman introduced about uh, 10 years ago now. This is the second eigen SNP. These are all my samples. 2,200 of those. And as you can see, um, the individuals cluster according to geographic region. There have been many, many papers that discuss how this correlates with geography. Uh, so you could get geographic coordinates where you collected your samples, approximate, of course. And you're going to get pretty high person correlation coefficients, for example, between um, uh, the x-axis and, say, longitude and the y-axis and latitude. So very popular plot. The Mexican population over there is totally out of place, of course. And that's because you are looking at just two principal components. So look at three principal components. Mexicans are an admixed population. They go in between uh, Europeans and Native Americans. And they end up right there when you look at the three-dimensional principal components analysis. So I've looked at enough of these plots over the years. But I do remember when, uh, what was it, like 2007 or something, when we started looking at those plots. And the first question was, what are these axes? I mean, we know singular vectors. There are nice mathematical definitions. We understand what they are from a mathematical perspective. But really, what are they? I mean, they are linear combinations of all your SNPs. I mean, SNPs are physical objects, right? They are loci in the genome. They lie within a gene. You have intuition about the gene. You understand something about them. But the eigen SNPs, the linear combinations, you don't get much about those. So can we replace those axes with something real? From a mathematical perspective, we wanted to get actual columns from the data that span the same subspace as opposed to uh, those eigenvectors, basically. And this is not a unique effect. It's not like I picked a data set where this particular correlation existed. This is another famous uh, data set, a little bit harder to get access to. You need to apply through dbgap. Um, uh, this is from a paper by John Novamber in uh, Nature about six years ago as well. Uh, and this is a PCA plot of 1,400 Europeans. This doesn't tell you much. But when you overlay it with a map of Europe, you get actually a correlation between the various populations and their location uh, in Europe. Uh, that made, I think, the New York Times science section, not surprisingly. OK, back to our mathematical problem. The mathematical problem is the following. This is what SVD does. Takes a matrix, expresses it as left singular vectors times something. 
So that's nice mathematically. It's the best Lorang approximation with respect to unitarily invariant norm, any norm that basically is invariant to rotations. Uh, you can solve for x. It's the singular values times the right singular vector, so that's great. Um, but the optimality comes at the cost of interpretability. So what are the left singular vectors? They are linear combinations of all your counts, and the question is, what does that mean? It's hard to interpret. Practitioners do not always have an easy time interpreting uh, linear combinations of their data. <coughs> so what Michael and I did back in 2009 was to introduce the notion of expressing the matrix instead of left singular vectors times something as columns times something. Actual counts from your data instead of singular vectors. And of course, you're going to lose something. What are you going to lose? You're going to lose optimality. You cannot beat SVD. SVD is the best low rank approximation if you are looking at unitarily invariant norms again. So you're going to lose optimality, but hopefully you're going to get quite close to the optimal. And second, the SVD, for example, would keep k singular vectors. Well, here you might keep a little bit more than k actual columns. So you will keep C columns. You'd like C to be close to K, but it might be a little bit larger. So you lose a couple of things again. The first thing you're going to lose is optimality. You are not going to get the best low rank approximation. And you might have to keep a few more actual columns than the eigenvectors. And you decide if that trade-off is worth it because of the additional interpretability that you're going to get uh, when you apply the CX factorization. Does this sound very similar to sparse So. Sparse PCA, that's a great point, and typically it's the question people ask at the end of the talk, but I might as well get to it now. Sparse PCA is saying, what if your singular vectors are a linear combination of a small number of columns? Here I'm saying just one column. So it's an extreme of the sparse PCA, basically. And it's, we, I, I don't know how to do sparse PCA with any of these methods. I, I don't. Sparse PCA is, a, I think, a harder problem, basically. So when you allow a little bit more sparsity than just one column, I don't know how to do it here. So here, I'm basically saying, instead of having eigenvectors, just one column. OK? Uh, let me tell you what is hard, what is easy. Uh, in case you are wondering, how am I going to figure out x? That's easy. Uh, it turns out that if what you care about is that a minus cx is small with respect to unitarily invariant norms, speckler, frobenius, trace, and whatnot, uh, then um, you just solve a least squares problem, and you're done. If um, so, so that part is easy, figuring out x is just actually uh, the pseudo inverse of c times a. That's easy. The difficult part, of course, is figuring out which columns to keep. It's like asking a combinatorial optimization problem. Let's try all possible sets of c columns. Let's see which one is the best. So that's a very naive way to solve it. Of course, computationally very expensive. If you want to solve it exactly, the problem is MP hard. Uh, that was actually recently proven with respect to the Frobenius and the spectral norm as well. Um, in numerical linear algebra, this has a history of about 50 years. It's called the column subset selection problem. It's asking the question, let's select a subset of columns so that A minus CX is as close to optimal as possible. I'm going to give you a simple solution through the leverage course. So that's my algorithm. You're going to pick columns of A, so I'm going to define a probability distribution over the columns of A, and I'm going to define that probability distribution to be the column leverage score, uh, the scores with respect to the target rank K. That's it. And then I'm going to pick columns with respect to that probability distribution. So I'm going to define the leverage, I'm, I'm going to compute the leverage scores or approximate them, and I'm going to sample columns with respect to the leverage scores, return the selected columns. And this algorithm has the following guarantees. A minus CX with respect to the Frobenius norm, if you don't remember what the Frobenius norm is, the Frobenius norm of a matrix is just the square root of the sum of the squares of its entries. So this says basically that um, if you sum up all the errors that you are making, the squares of the errors that you are making, they're going to be bounded. By what? By 1 plus epsilon times the best you can do. In theoretical computer science, that's called a relative error approximation and it's sort of the golden standard. That's what you want to be able to get. So you lose a little bit. Relative error close to the best possible. If you lose a little bit here, how many columns are you going to keep? Well, you're going to keep k over epsilon squares times uh, k over epsilon squared times log k over epsilon squared. I think this has been removed by other people uh, a, a, few, a few months ago, actually. Uh, so it's basically k log k over epsilon squared. So you're going to need to keep more than k to get the guarantee that I'm trying to give you here. And because you are sampling, you, there is a failure probability. In this case, I made the failure probability 10%. 
uh, you could drive it down as much as you want by just repeating the algorithm a few times. The most cost efficient, the most, uh, the most computationally intensive part of this algorithm is the computation or the approximation of the leverage scores, and we know how to do that in order m and k time, at least theoretically. So you said it's larger than k. Right. You're gonna more than k, right? More than k. K over epsilon square. Epsilon is the approximation error that you want times log k. Oh, so <laughs> okay, my bad. I'm sorry? Yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah, c is equal to that. The, the big goal here is yeah. hiding constants. Uh -huh. There is a thousand there which has been brought down to like five. So, so in a k is when you take the k to c? A k is correct. A k is the best rank k approximation to a, I should have said that. So this is this is the best you can do with exactly k eigenvectors, uh, singular vectors. That's the best you can do. So you're going to get the relative error close to that. You lose something, and you keep that much. We'll bring this down, but the algorithm is not going to be that simple. It's not exactly the best. It's, the, it's even better than that. It's, the, it's the k best eigenvector? Like this is the best rank k approximation. Or is it like the best k uh, part? No, 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 no. So that, good point. So, so I think what you are asking is, um, Good point. So potentially, one could say, is it possible to say here that I'm going to get 1 plus epsilon co co close to what I can do with the best k columns? That we don't have a proof for. So what we are doing is we're using a proxy to that, which is even worse. So we're using the a minus a k. You are right. And I don't think anybody has tried to do the other problem with respect to the true optimal. This is strictly less than the true optimal. So correct. Yes? So you're saying that for any particular thing, you have this bound. Correct. But then that's agnostic to what the, the, the optimal thing is. Correct. Uh, that, no, no, no. Actually, I'm, I'm saying something slightly different. This is definitely agnostic to an optimal k or anything. Give me any k this holds. Uh, what Aaron is saying is that in theoretical computer science, typically you'd like here to have the best you can do with k actual columns from the matrix. Because this is the best rank k approximation, which has k eigenvectors, k linear combinations. This is strictly better uh, in the sense that it achieves less error than what would happen with actual columns. So the guarantee is a bit pessimistic, basically. But we just have no way of proving anything else. And there are matrices for which, by the way, this would be tight, orthogonal matrices, for example. Then actual columns and left eigenvectors would be the same. But in general, you, could, you might be able to get something better. So there is a lower bound here, which basically says that a variant of that, I'm going to show that in a couple of slides, is, is tight. So if you are thinking of getting rid of epsilon square, you'll get rid of epsilon square, the square. But epsilon is going to be there. So if your epsilon is, uh, I don't know, 10 to the minus 5, you're in trouble. And there is lower bounds there. There are lower bounds there saying that you're not going to be able for adversarial matrices to beat that. Um, for well-behaved matrices, in many cases, you are able to get k plus 5 columns, but that's empirical, that basically captures that kind of information. For instance, for that SMP kinetic data. For the SNP data, yeah. The SNP data. You mentioned like there were like 2,000. I'll show a couple of pictures. We can come back to that. Okay. Certainly, this is theory, right? I mean, so this is theory. You prove for worst. You do the typical thing that TCS people like. So you prove it for any matrix. We don't have made, we haven't made assumptions on A, and as far as I can, as, as I know, it's not like many people have made assumptions on A and proven something. So it'd be nice to actually see something for special families of matrices. Um, I'm going to use a slightly different SNP matrix, not the one that I showed before, because I want to draw it on uh, a slide. So this is a data set that actually goes back now 10 years. 270 individuals, nine populations only, the, some coverage throughout the world, 10,000 SNPs only. So. The reason I'm doing that is because I want to draw it here. Uh, these are the rows, the samples. These are the columns, the SNPs. And I've used three colors. Remember, SNP matrices, think of every entry as being homozygotic in one allele, homozygotic in the other allele, or heterozygotic. So you have three colors, red, green, and black here. This is what your matrix looks like. Uh, if I applied PCA, because I didn't show you that, if I applied PCA on this matrix, by now you've probably figured out that the populations are going to cluster uh, together in nice ways. These are the African populations. The Spaniards are here. These are Asian populations. And Native Americans are up there. Um, if I compute the leverage scores, and again, this is a property that you see in all the population genetics matrices, you are going to get 
a distribution like this, you get some very clear outliers. So you get um, some SNPs that clearly have a high score. Let's pull them out and see what happens. So if I pull out, let's say, the top 30 in this case, but we've done extensive studies also in the other matrix as well, uh, where we demonstrate how these uh, level scores behave, uh, you're going to get, as you can see here, you're going to get some pattern in Africa, some other pattern in Europe here, no real pattern in Asia, but there are patterns in the Native Americans. Uh, and you can use those SNPs basically, and we've done that, of course, in cross-validation experiments, uh, use also independent data sets to at least say uh, that a particular individual is coming from a certain uh, region of the world, so at least at a continental level, uh, with some probability. And we've gone down uh, trying to also characterize much more accurately uh, particular populations of origin and so on and so forth using panels of ancestry informative markers. That's what we're basically uh, revealing here. Uh, the way to think about it, if you are a computer scientist, is that we're basically doing feature selection. So these are your features. And you want to select a subset of features, and we do that in an unsupervised manner, that basically can, for example, cluster your individuals in their respective continent of origin. And SNPs is just one application, and we've applied it in a number of other um, domains. Uh, work in progress, that's with uh, Ken Kidd at Yale, a population geneticist, uh, a much larger uh, sample even from the one that I described before. Uh, we are doing similar studies here, and this time I think I have functional characterization. So if you look at the, the SNPs, remember loci in the genome, some of them lie within a particular gene. Um, and here are the top 10, I think, uh, genes that we pick out. And a bunch of those, EDRA, for example, is well known to be associated with hair follicle formation. I think we had something associated with skin color as well. Yeah, OCA2. Um, and a bunch of those, of course, had been identified in previous studies as well to be um, uh, loci that were good candidates for uh, natural selection and other selective pressures. Yeah. So you actually did select, you said 30, about 30. Oh, no, no, well, in this but case, not, yeah. But it's, but there was, I mean, if I understand correctly, there was no leverage of the labels of that data, meaning you had the, the continents. But what you did was just calculate the leverage score for each feature. And Correct. Sample Correct. And how is, I mean, I'm kind of missing a, a, a link here. Between so, so. The, the labels of the data and how you selected them. So, you select in an unsupervised but you still manner. That it, it could, could cluster them. So, so, so you select in an unsupervised manner. You run K means clustering, for example. You figure out four clusters. You see that precision recall with continents is very high. Or, now I give you a new sample from AGTP, from HubMap, from Kenkill's uh, data. I genotype only those 30 markers, and I find the nearest neighbor to what is here. No, I understand the, how, how you do the classification. Okay. I'm asking here, you, you took all these features and all the continents, mm -hmm. and then you selected the best number of features without looking at the labels. You just calculated leverage Correct. scores for each Correct. feature Correct. and Correct. sampled the best. So the feature selection is unsupervised. It to be that it could cl cluster, which is a kind of a surprise to me, because there was, in the calculation of the best features, there was no leverage for the, for the labels, but it still worked, so it's kind of... So the reason it works, so th that's a very good point. So in general, you would not expect it to work, right? And let me give you an example where it doesn't work. If, you were, if, if this data did not correspond to continents, but they corresponded to, for example, cases and controls, um, people who have a particular disease, people who don't have a disease, this would not work at all. Turns out that ancestry, basically, is extremely uh, dominant, let's say, throughout the genome. It's right there. Why? Because of this. If you do a principal components analysis, this is what you get. This is unsupervised. What am I doing? I'm picking SNPs, features, of high leverage. Well, what am I recreating? I'm recreating those axes. That's the reason it works. Because the signal is right there. PCA clusters, the leverage scores just pick features that are correlated with the axis. So that's why it works. In the case control study, for example, so if you had disease, you would not be able by PCA to separate the cases from the controls. It'd be all mixed. Actually, what you'd be getting, you'd be getting, again, ancestry of the samples you have collected. Right. And you would not be able, of course, to do that. So the reason it worked is because the signal is so dominant. And PCA recovers it. OK. Um, I have five minutes, right? Yeah. OK. Um, Concerns. 
The first concern has to do with the fact that the leverage scores are a univariate statistic. If two SNPs are identical, they'll get the same leverage score. In general, if in feature selection, you do not want to keep identical features. So you want to avoid that. There is redundancy there. So identical SNPs all have, let's say, or features, all have high leverage. You don't want to keep all of them. You cannot avoid it by looking at a univariate statistic. There are other ways to avoid it. As a matter of fact, again, um, this is the reason you have this k log k there. It's from coupon collector. It's fundamental. It's because you are doing sampling. You are not going to avoid that. So you need other techniques, non-sampling based, if you want to do better and you want to get rid of correlated features. Stability. That has become quite an issue over the past year or so. Uh, a number of groups are actually working on this. How sensitive are the leverage scores if you basically sneeze on the data? If you have a small perturbation, that's an expression that I'm borrowing from Michael. Um, so if you have a small perturbation on the data, uh, how sensitive are the leverage scores? Do they change a lot? What happens if I omit a few samples? Are the, are, are, are the SNPs that I'm going to select going to change a lot? It turns out that you are reasonably stable, but no formal analysis. And even the empirical evidence that we have is fairly weak at this point. Finally, um, in general, when you do feature selection, some of the features are only relevant for a subset of the objects that you have. So you'd like some finer control over the, um, instead of just having you know, just a full row, a full column, I'd like to get at a better level, maybe look at a block of a matrix, maybe even at a single element. And that has been sort of the motivation here of looking at element-wise uh, leverage scores. I mean, is it possible to get a finer control over the matrix instead of looking at a full row, a full column? Let me address the first point. The first point is, um, again, sort of what would be interesting in theoretical computer scientists. What is the best number of rows or columns of a matrix that you can keep in order to get a relative error approximation with actual columns? Turns out, uh, that's a paper with my former student, Christos Boutsidis and Malik Magdon Ismail a few years ago, uh, you can get nice relative error bounds, just like the ones I presented before, by selecting 2k over epsilon columns. So no log k, the constant is down to 2, epsilon square is down to epsilon. The 2 was actually removed by um, uh, Venkat and uh, Ali at uh, CMU uh, in like a few months after we published the first paper. Now you lose simplicity. It's, this doesn't go through leverage scores anymore. It's a much more complicated procedure. It's actually uh, sort of the precursor. This is work by uh, Batson, Spielman, and Srivastava. This is the precursor of the work that they did uh, to prove the condition singer conjecture last year. Uh, the running time also blows up. At this point, this is mostly of theoretical interest. We don't really have something um, that runs well in practice. And the best follow-up that I know of uh, by Christos and uh, David, uh, this is going to be in stock this year. Uh, brings down this running time to something much better. But again, uh, these are theory papers. Okay, So I don't really know how they're going to work uh, in practice. But there are certainly directions to explore here. Let me say that we've tried to implement this paper, of course, and numerical stability becomes a huge issue. We get, we're getting uh, a big, in big trouble with numerical instabilities. Okay, um, I'll just say a couple of words about the element-wise leverage scores. Um, over the past few months, uh, a number of people have wondered about what if we try to get leverage scores, but at the element level. So instead of having a whole row, a whole column, what about defining something for elements of the matrix? So you want to find out object feature combinations instead of a whole object or a whole feature, just an object feature combination that exerts dis disproportionate influence uh, to your matrix. Um, and of course, why do you do that? Because in uh, diagnostic data analysis, you want to go back and look at those object features and say that perhaps they're outliers, there was some error there or something, or perhaps they're just really important object feature combinations, and you need to look at them more carefully. Nice connections with element-wise sampling. So uh, I started my talk by saying, let's pick a sample of rows or columns from a matrix. Of course, another question would be, what if you keep a sample of elements from a matrix? This has been explored, introduced by Dimitris Akhriopoulos and Frank Maxeri in stock 2001. Also goes under uh, the line of work that it has been called matrix completion, uh, pioneered by Emmanuel Kandes and Ben Recht. And a number of people uh, have contributed important things there. Um, I'll skip that. And let me say, uh, this is um, a result by uh, Yi Dong uh, Chen, and he's actually here at Berkeley working with Martin Wainwright, who basically said, and forget about the complicated notation, this is sort of the row leverage, this is the column leverage, who basically said that if you define an element-wise notion 
of the leverage core that combines the row and column leverage. So basically an entry is important if the corresponding row and the corresponding column are important. Then it turns out that this has nice properties. You can use this sample of entries to reconstruct the matrix uh, nicely using um, the line of work that uh, Recht and Candes uh, introduced through the so-called uh, trace minimization. Uh, I'm not going to get into details. Again, um, a recent result uh, and uh, over the past few months also we've been independently working on the same. And what we observed is that if you just use the row and column leverage and sneeze at your data, there is no robustness. You need something else. And we have lots of simulators to demonstrate that, but no real theory yet. The extra term that saves the day is to look at the way the left and right singular vectors talk to each other and introduce that also in the element-wise leverage scores. From a theoretical perspective, the results I can prove are as good as the Yidong uh, Chen and Tal results, so I cannot improve those. But in the simulations, it looks like this cross term uh, helps quite a bit. It'd be nice to develop some nice theory. We're working on this, talking to a number of people about that. So we have no theory yet. Um, we don't have a simpler proof than, I suspect that there is a simpler proof than the proof that uh, Chen et al. have, but we don't have that yet either. And of course, we've been inspired by the work that Ben has done uh, over the past several years on that. I'm out of time, so let me skip it. Um, these are just how element y scores behave, but let's leave that for a future talk. And let me just say that um, leverage scores a statistic on rows and counts that reveals the most influential rows and counts of the matrix. We are starting to look at extensions, and there has been some preliminary theory and some preliminary empirical evidence uh, for element-wise uh, leverage scores. An additional fact that I did not discuss at all is that, um, and has been very useful again in TCS, is that if you pre-process your matrix by uh, random projection type matrices like random sign matrices, Gaussian matrices, the randomized Hadamard transform, or the more recent stuff that uh, Michael and Zhang Meng or uh, David Goodoff and Ken Clarkson had in stock last year, then the leverage scores are being uniformized. So you can basically wash out the structure of the leverage scores, make them uniform. That's quite useful if what you care about is to approximate singular vectors. You wash out the structure, you pick a uniform sample, you get very nice relative error approximations actually uh, to the singular vectors of a matrix different line of work that I did not discuss. I'm going to stop right here and thank you very much for your time.